All right, so you can always go on Think Central and get onto this story if you'd like or any of the stories. I suggest that you either watch this or read it yourself every night so that you're prepared on Friday for the test. Our selection this week is Marvin of the Great North Woods, written by Katherine Lasky, illustrated by Kevin Hawks. In this selection, a boy faces many challenges in an unfamiliar place. Evaluate how well the author helps you to see this new world through the boy's eyes. One thing I want you guys to listen for as I'm reading is how I stress certain words based on punctuation or how I feel that it goes best with the story. So let's start. After his great aunt Sadie died of the influenza, Marvin's mother and father decided to send him away from the city to keep him safe. Marvin heard them talk it over with Uncle Moishi and Aunt Gisa one night as he sat hidden on the stairs. How will he get along in a logging camp, a boy of ten, all by himself, asked Aunt Kisa. I want him to live to be a man, said Mama quietly. He must go. But Marvin's very small for his age, said Uncle Moishi. He won't even be able to lift a saw. Marvin glowered and huddled closer to the wall. He's got a head for numbers. He'll keep the book, said Papa. Marvin knew that he was good at math in school, but a logging camp? I've already talked to my friend Mr. Murray at this camp up north, Papa continued. Marvin should go right away. The next day, Marvin's mother cut down an old overcoat of Papa's and lined it with scraps of beaver fur. From the scraps of the scraps, she lined Marvin's cap and made ear flaps. Marvin turned to his mother. Mama, I don't know how to speak French. You said most of the men who work there are French-Canadian, except for Mr. Murray. You just say bonjour. Bonjour, Marvin repeated. It means hello, Mama said. You'll learn the rest, like your father and I did when we came from Russia. Your mother's right, said Papa. Look, we are living proof. When we came here, not a word of English, just Russian and Yiddish. Now look at us. We talk English to all our children. I talk English to my boss. We sing in English. We make jokes in English. Marvin hoped his father wouldn't tell the chicken joke. It was a dumb joke. Two days later, the morning Marvin was to leave, Mama made lockies and gnishes. While, we were, while they were piping hot, she wrapped them in newspaper and put two in each of his coat pockets and one inside his cap to keep him warm. Don't eat them until they're almost cold, she told him. Then they'll warm you twice. At the train station, Papa handed Marvin the skis he had made for his son's sixth birthday. Papa, I've never skied in the country before, Marvin said anxiously. You've skied in the city, up and down every hill in Duluth, and there are many. How far do I have to ski? Five miles, remember? It's all flat. You'll go like a shot. The train pulled out of the station, and the glass grew foggy with Marvin's breath as he said soft goodbyes through the window. Would his family be all right until he came home in the spring? He wished he could take his sisters to the logging camp to keep them safe from the influenza, too. He saw them all there on the platform. Mama, Papa, has two big sisters, his two little sisters, bundled in their coats, waving. As the train moved away, the little sisters blurred into the big ones. The big sisters blended into Papa and Mama. They were all one bundle waving goodbye to him, Marvin, alone on the train, going far, far away to the great north woods. Marvin ate his first latke when the train stopped in Floodwood. It was almost cold. An hour passed and Marvin ate another latke, then another. Outside the land stretched white until it reached the tree. The dark band of the forest rested on the horizon as the train sped through the white world of the north. Almost five hours later, in Bemidji, Minnesota, Marvin stood alone on the platform as the train rolled away. Beyond the depot, a road ran straight and flat to where the white landscape met the forest. Marvin felt small, very small, and the road looked like it went on forever. He thought of the big waving bundle on the train platform back in Duluth. What were they doing now? His sisters, his mother, his father? It was too cold to stand still, so Marvin ate the his cap, slapped his cap back on his head, strapped on his skis, and started for the shadowy thread on the horizon. His father had told him that five miles down the road, Mr. Murray, a very big man with a handsome wax mustache, would be waiting for him. 
The way was flat, and the snow was well packed. Marvin thought if he kept up a good pace, he would reach the camp just after sunset. The thin thread of the forest thickened to a dark ribbon. Soon he could smell the sharp green fragrance of freshly cut timber, and soon after that he spotted a speck in the distance. The speck grew into a smudge. Before long, the smudge wore a muffler and a fur hat. Between the top of the muffler and the bottom of the hat, a huge mustache bristled with frost. Come along, boy, Mr. Murray turned his snowshoes toward the camp at the edge of the forest. I'm like to freeze my derriere off. That's French for bottom. So Marvin thought, now I know two words in French. I can say, hello, bottom. As they entered the camp, the longest shadows Marvin had ever seen stretched across the snow, and he realized with a start that the shadows were the lumberjack walking in the moonlight. He could smell hay and manure and saw the silhouettes of horses stomping in a snowy corral. From a nearby log building, he had heard the lively squeaks of a fiddle. It seemed for a moment as if the horses were keeping time to the music. Mr. Murray must have thought the same. You want to watch the horses dance or the jacks, he laughed. Come along, we'll take a look. When they entered the building, the long shadows from the yard suddenly sprung to life. Marvin stared. Immense men with long beards and wild hair were jumping around to the fiddler's tunes like a pack of frantic grizzly bears. They were the biggest and wildest men Marvin had ever seen. Marvin could have watched the dancing all night, but Mr. Murray said, Come on, Marvin, we start early in the morning. I'll show you where you'll be living. Mr. Murray took Marvin to the small office where he would work and sleep. In Duluth, Marvin had to share a bedroom with his two younger sisters and all of their dolls and toys. But this room was his, all his, and he liked it. A bed with a bearskin on it sat across from a wood stove. Nearby, wood was stacked neatly. The big desk had cubby holes for papers, envelopes, glue pots, and blotter strips. And on the desk, there were blocks of paper and a big black ledger. There were pencils in a blue glass jar, as well as an inkwell. Marvin hoped that somewhere there was a very good pen, a fountain pen. In addition to keeping payroll, Mr. Murray said, you have another job. The first bell in the morning is at 4 o'clock, second bell at 4.15, third bell is at 4.20. By 4.25, if any jack is still in the sack, he's in, in retard, late. So you, son, are the fourth bell. Starting tomorrow, you go into the bunkhouses and wake less in retards. How? You tap them on the shoulder, give them a shake, scream in their ear if you have to. Then Mr. Murray said goodnight, and Marvin was alone again. It seemed to Marvin he had just crawled under the bare skin when he heard the first bell. The fire was out, and the room was cold and dark. He lit the kerosene lamp and pulled on his double-thick long underwear, two pair of socks, two pairs of knickers, and two sweaters. Then he put on his cut-down overcoat. Hmm. After the second bell, Marvin heard the jack heading toward the eating hall. It was nearly time for his first job. He ran through the cold morning darkness to the bunkhouse, peeked in, and counted five huge lumps in the shadows, five jacks in the sacks. Marvin waited just inside the door. At the third bell, Marvin was relieved to see two jacks climb out of bed. He thought there must be a brooch, a Hebrew blessing for something like this. His father knew all sorts of brooches, blessings for seeing the sunrise, blessings for the first bottom of spring, blossom of spring. Was there a brooch for a rising lumberjack? If he said a brooch, maybe the other three would get up on their own. One lump stirred, then another. They grunted, rolled, and climbed out from under the covers. Their huge shadows slid across the ceiling. One jack was still in the sack. Marvin took a deep breath, walked bravely over to the bed, reached out, and tapped the jack's shoulder. It was like poking a granite boulder. The jack's beard ran straight into his long, shaggy hair. Marvin couldn't even find an ear to shout into. He cupped his hands around his mouth and leaned forward. Up! The, la the jack grunted and muttered something in French. Get up, Marvin pleaded. Another jack pulled on his boots, boomed, Levez toi Jean-Louis, levez toi and shuffled out the door.
Levez-toi, Jean-Louis. Levez-toi, Marvin repeated. Jean-Louis opened one eye. It glittered like a blue star beneath his thick black eyebrow. He squinted as if trying to make out the shape in front of him, then blinked and sat up. Bonjour, Marvin whispered. We oui, as do. Well, as ton nom. I don't speak French. Just bonjour, derriere, and le vitoi. That's all? No more? The man opened his eyes wide now. So what is your name? Marvin. Ah, Marvin. Jean-Louis repeated as if he tasting the sound of his name. Will you get up? Marvin asked anxiously. Jean-Louis growled and fixed him in the hard blue squint of one eye. Please. Marvin stood straight and tried not to tremble. Jean-Louis grunted and swung his feet from beneath the covers. They were as big as skillets, and one of his huge toenails was bruised black and blue. Marvin tried not to stare. Marvin and Jean-Louis were the last to arrive at the breakfast table. The only sounds were those of chewing and the clink of forks and knives against the plates. At each place were three stacks of flapjacks, one big steak, eight strips of bacon, and a bowl of oatmeal. In the middle of the table were bowls of potatoes and beans with molasses, platters with pies and cakes, and blue jugs filled with tea, coffee, and milk. Marvin stared at the food in dismay. It's not kosher, he thought. In Marvin's house, it was against ancient Jewish law to eat dairy products and meat together. And never, ever did a Jew eat bacon. Marvin came to a quick decision. One day he would eat the flapjacks and oatmeal with milk. The next day he would eat the steak and the oatmeal without milk, and never the bacon. After breakfast, as they did every morning, the jacks went to the tool house to get their saws and axes. Then, wearing snowshoes and pulling huge sleds piled with equipment, they made their way into the great woods where they would work all day. Marvin went directly to his office after breakfast. Mr. Murray was already there, setting out Marvin's work. A fresh pot of ink was thawing in a bowl of hot water on the wood stove. There were two boxes on the desk filled with scraps of paper. Cord chips, Mr. Murray said. The jacks are paid according to the number of cords they cut in a pay period, two weeks. You figure it out. I'm no good as a bookkeeper and have enough other things to do around here. Each chit should have the jack's name, or if he can't write, his symbol. His symbol, Marvin asked weakly. Yes, John louis is a thumbprint. Here's one. He held up a small piece of paper with a thumbprint on it the size of a baby's fist. Marvin blinked. It was all very confusing. Sometimes two names were on one chip. These were called doublies. There were even some triplies. This meant more calculations, and sometimes chips were in the wrong pay period box. Marvin sat staring at the scraps. There is no system, he muttered. Where to begin? His mother always made a list when she had many things to do. So first Marvin listed the Jack's names alphabetically and noted the proper symbol for those who could not write. Then he listed the dates of a single pay period, coded each chit with the date, and with the ruler made a chart. By the end of the morning, Marvin had a system and knew the symbol, the name or symbol for each man. There were many chits with the huge thumbprint of Jean-Louis. Each day Marvin worked until midday, when he went into the cookhouse and ate baked beans and two kinds of pie with Mr. Murray and the cook. After lunch, he returned to his office and worked until the jacks returned from the forest for supper. By Friday of the second week, Marvin had learned his job so well that he finished early. He had not been on his skis since he had arrived at camp. Every day the routine was simply meals and work, and Marvin kept to his office and away from the lumberjacks as much as he could. But today he wanted to explore. So he put on his skis and followed the sled path into the wood. He glided forward, his skis making soft whisking sounds in the snow. This certainly was different from city skiing in Duluth, where he would dodge the ragman's cart or the milkman's wagon, where the sky was notched with chimney pots, belching smoke, where the snow turned sooty as soon as it fell. Here in the great north woods, all was still and white. Beads of ice glistened on bare branches like jewels. The frosted needles of pine and spruce prickled the eggshell sky, and a ghostly moon began to climb over the trees, treetops. Marvin came upon a frozen lake covered with snow, 
which lay in a circle of tall trees like a bowl of sugar. He skimmed out across it on his skis, his cheeks stinging in the cold air, and stopped in the middle to listen to the quietness. And then Marvin heard a deep, low growl. At the edge of a lake as a shower of snow fell from a pine. A grizzly bear? Marvin gripped his ski pole. A grizzly awake in the winter? What would he do if a bear came after him? Could he hide? Could he out-ski a grizzly? Marvin began to tremble, but he knew that he must remain still, very still. Maybe, Marvin thought desperately, the grizzly would think he was a small tree growing in the middle of the lake. He tried very hard to look like a tree, but concentrating on being a tree was difficult because Marvin kept thinking of the bundle on the train platform, his mother, his father, his two big sisters, and his two little sisters. He belonged in Duluth with them, not in the middle of the great north woods with the grizzly. The hot tears streaming down his cheeks turned cold, then froze. When another tree showered snow, Marvin, startled, shot across the lake. As he reached the shore, a huge shadow slid from behind the trees. The breath froze in Marvin's throat. In the thick purple shadows, he saw a blue twinkle. Ah, Marvin! Jean-Louis had a glistening axe in one hand. He looked taller than ever. I mark the tree for cutting next season. He stepped closer to the trunk and swung the axe hard. Snow showered at Marvin's feet. Ah, mon petit, you cry. Jean-Louis took off his glove and rubbed his huge thumb down Marvin's cheek. You miss your mama, your papa? Marvin nodded silently. Jean-Louis, he whispered. The huge lumberjack bent closer. I thought you were a grizzly bear. You what? Jean-Louis gasped. You think I was a grizzly? And Jean-Louis began to laugh, and as he roared, more snow fell from the tree, for his laugh was as powerful as his axe. As they made their way back to the sled pass, Marvin heard a French song drifting through the woods. The other jacks came down the path, their saws and axes slung across their shoulders, and Marvin and Jean-Louis joined them. Evening shadows fell through the trees, and as Marvin skied alongside the huge men, he hummed the tune they were singing. One day followed the next, every morning in that time when the night had worn thin, but the day had not yet dawned. Marvin shouted, Up! Levez-toi! Levez-toi! to Jean-Louis. Together they would go to the dining hall where one day Marvin would eat steak and oatmeal without milk. The next day he would eat oatmeal with milk and flapjacks but no steak. Jean-Louis always ate the bacon and anything else Marvin left. And every afternoon after that Marvin would finish his work well before sunset and ski into the woods. Although the worry that his family might catch the terrible sickness nagged at him constantly, when he was in his woods his fears grew dim in the silence and shadows of the winter forest. And every day he would fall in beside Jean-Louis as the jacks returned to camp, and he would hum the French songs that Jean-Louis told him were about a beautiful woman in the far, far north, or a lonely bear in its den, or a lovely maiden named Go With Clouds. At night, after supper was done, Marvin learned the lumberjack songs and how to play their games the ones he could manage, like axe throwing. A jack would heave an axe from 30 paces at the tail end of the log. For Marvin, they moved the mark up 10 feet. The jacks challenged each other to barrel lifting and buck saw contests, but Marvin was too small for those. He was not, however, too small to dance. Sometimes he danced on the floor, and sometimes Jean-Louis lifted him, and Marvin did a little two-step right there in his stocking feet on the shoulders of the big lumberjack. In April, four months after Marvin had arrived at the camp, the snow began to melt. Mr. Murray said to Marvin, I promised your parents I'd send you back while there was still enough snow for you to ski on. Every day it grows warmer. You better go before you have to swim out of here. I'll send your parents a letter to say you're coming home, but I don't know what I'll do for a bookkeeper. So it was planned that Marvin would leave on the last day of the month. When the day came, he went to the bunkhouse to find Jean-Louis. Ah, Marvin! Jean-Louis tasted Marvin's name as, if, as he had the first time he had ever said it, as if it were the most delicious French pastry in the world. I have something for you, mon petit. 
He got up and opened the chest at the end of his bed. You are a woodsman now, he said, and handed Marvin a brand new axe. The head was sharp and glinting. The handle glistened like dark honey. Merci, Jean-Louis, merci beaucoup, Marvin whispered. Jean-Louis went with Marvin all the way to the train station. When the snow ran out on the banks of a muddy creek near the depot, he turned to Marvin, grinned widely, and said, Up, up, levé toi, Marvin. The giant of a man swung the small boy onto his shoulders, skis and all, and carried him across to the opposite bank. As the train pulled up, or pulled away, Marvin waved at Jean-Louis through the window, which had become foggy with his breath. breath. Au revoir, he murmured. Au revoir, Jean-Louis. Marvin sat alone on the train and thought of his family. Who would be waiting for him at the station? He felt the edges of his new axe. It was so sharp, so bright. But it was good only for cutting wood. What could it do against the terrible flu that had sent him away? With each mile, the land slid out from under its snowy cover. When the train finally pulled into the station in Duluth, Marvin pressed his face against the window, the glass fogging as he searched the crowd on the platform. When Marvin stepped down from the train, he was still searching. Everyone looked pale and winter-worn, and not a single face was familiar. Then suddenly, he was being smothered with kisses and hugs. His little sisters were grabbing him around his waist, his big sisters were kissing his ears, and then all of them tumbled into Mama and Papa's arms, and they were one big hugging bundle. You're not dead, Marvin said. His sisters, Mama, Papa, Aunt Gisa, and Uncle Moishi crowded round him in a tight circle. He turned slowly to look at each face. Nobody's dead, Marvin repeated softly. The sickness is over, said Mama, and you are finally home. The end. All right, so you know the deal. Uh, sign off on watching. Do a summary of the story in your notebook. And uh, if you have any questions or any words that you didn't understand, and there was a lot in here with French and whatnot, please write those down, and we will clarify them tomorrow.